Good evening, child. Hello, James. I know you're listening to this. I can smell your fear. Welcome back, guys, to Heart of Darkness by uh, James Conrad. Um, we're going to be continuing with part one, starting on page 15. Um, today's funny word is scrimps. Um, yep, where we left off last time. Are, there's some people on a boat, but that's not really the story. Uh, one of the guys on the boat's telling this this story that I'm pretty certain is actually just the entire book all takes place in the story that he's telling. A lot of a lot of novels from this time period sort of went like that. But anyways, in his story, um, he just said, "Oh, I you know I'm a sailor now, but I used to sail and uh, I was sailing to this cool place, and he was at this office." In Yield, England. Yeah, I had a water bottle in England. And he's um, talking with the headmaster about getting shipped off. I think it's to Africa, this new place. Um, But that's where we're leaving off. He's still in the office, so let's get it underway. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, favorite, subscribe in the comments. Sleepless Tales. Um, okay, let's continue then. Wait, hold on. I've got one more stupid interjection before I start continuing. Have you guys ever seen... um? Uh, by Lil Dicky, it's, uh, pr is it called Professional Rapper? It's the one with Snoop Dogg. For some reason, it reminds me of this scene. I could not, I think it's because I imagine the main character is Lil Dicky, and this headmaster is Snoop Dogg, and, you know, Young D walks in, and he just says, what's up, fam lamb? I'm Jewish, and I think this guy's Irish, probably. I don't know my UK history that well, all I know is the funny accent. Anyways, okay, after that, let's continue. Heart of Darkness. There was yet a visit to the doctor, a simple formality, assured me the secretary, with an air of taking an immense part in all my sorrows. Accordingly, a young chap wearing his hat over the left eyebrow, some clerk I suppose, there must have been clerks in the business, though the house was still a house in the city of the dead, came from somewhere upstairs and led me forth. He was shabby and careless, with ink stains on the sleeves of his jacket and his cravat was a large, billowy, or a chin shaped like a toe of an old boot. It was a little too early for the doctor, so I proposed a drink, and thereupon he developed a vein of joviality. As we sat over our vermouths, he glorified the company's business, and by and by I expressed casually my surprise at him not going out there. He became very cool and collected all at once. I'm not a fool as I look, quoth Plato and his disciples. He said, sententiously, emptied his glass with great resolution, and we rose. The old doctor felt my pulse, evidently thinking of something else the while. Good, good for there, he mumbled, and then with a certain eagerness asked me whether I would let him measure my head. Rather surprised, I said, yes. When he produced a thing like calipers and got the dimensions back and front in every way, taking notes carefully. He was an unshaven little man, in a threadbare coat like a gobardine, with his feet in slippers, and I thought him a harmless fool. I always ask leave, in the entrance of science, to measure the cranny of those going out there, he said. And when they come back, too, I asked. Oh, I never see them, he remarked. And moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. He smiled. As if that's some quiet joke. So you are going out there. Famous. Interesting, too. He gave me a searching glance. Made another note. Never any madness in your family, he asked, in a matter-of-fact tone. I felt very annoyed. Is that question in the interest of science, too? It would be, he said, without taking notice of my irritation. Interesting for science to watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot, but... Are you an alienist? I interrupted. Every doctor should be. A little. Answered that original, imperturbably. I have a little theory which you monsieurs who go out there must help me to prove. This is my share in the advantages my country shall reap from the possession of such magnificent dependency. The mere wealth I leave to others. 
Pardon my questions, but you're the first Englishman coming under my observation. I hasten to assure him that I was not in the least typical. If I were, said I, I wouldn't be talking like this with you. What you say is rather profound, probably erroneous, he said with a laugh. Avoid irritation, more than exposure to the sun. Not you. How do you English say, eh? Goodbye, yeah, goodbye, adieu. In the tropics, one must before everything keep calm. And he lifted a warning forefinger. Do calm, do calm, adieu. One thing more remained to do. Say goodbye to my excellent aunt. I found her triumphant. I had a cup of tea. The last decent cup of tea for many days. And in a room... That most soothingly looked just as you'd expect a lady's drawing room to look. We had a long, quiet chat by the fireside. In the course of these confidences, it became quite plain to me that I had been represented to the wife of the high dignitary, and goodness knows to how many more people besides, as an exceptional and gifted creature, a piece of good fortune for the company. A man you don't get hold of every day. Good heavens. And I was going to take charge of a two half penny river steamboat with a penny whistle attached. It appeared, however, I was also one of the workers with a capital, you know. Something like an emissary of light. Something like a lower sort of apostle. There had been a lot of rot let loose in print and talk just all about that time. And that excellent woman, living right in the rush of all that humbug, got carried off her feet. If she talked about weaning those ignorant millions from their horrid ways. Till, upon my word, she made me quite uncomfortable. I ventured to hint that the company was run for profit. Ah, you forget, dear Charlie, that the laborer is worthy of his hire, she said, brightly. It's queer how out of touch with truth women are. They live in a world of their own, and there's never been anything like it. Never can be. It is too beautiful altogether, and if they were to set it up, you'd go to pieces before the first sunset. Translator's note, I don't know why I keep reading books where the narrator randomly decides to start harassing women for like a paragraph or two. I think it's happened in probably the last three books that I've done, and I haven't done that many, so that's most of them. But anyways. Some confounded fact we men have been living with contentedly ever since the day of creation would start up and knock the whole thing over. After this I got embraced, told to wear flannel, and be sure to write often, and so on. And I left. In the street, I don't know why, a queer feeling came over me that I was an imposter. Odd thing that I... I used to clear out for any part of the world at 24 hours notice, with less thought than most men give to the crossing of a street, had a moment, no one say of hesitation, but of startled pause, before this commonplace affair. The best way I can explain it to you is by saying that, for a second or two, I felt as though instead of going to the center of a continent, I were about to set off for the center of the earth. I left in a French steamer, and she called in every blamed port they have out there. For, as far as I could see, the sole purpose of landing soldiers and custom house officers. I watched the coast. Watching a coast as it slips by the ship is like thinking about an enigma. There it is before you, smiling, frowning, inviting, grand, mean, insipid, or savage, and always mute with an air of whispering. Come and find out. This one was almost featureless, as if still in the making, with an aspect of monotonous griminess. On the edge of a colossal jungle, so dark green as to be almost black, fringed with white surf, ran straight like a ruled line, far, far away along a blue sea whose glitter was blurred by a creeping mist. The sun was fierce, and the land seemed to glisten and drip with steam. Here and there, grayish whitish specks showed up clustered inside the white surf, with a flag flying above them, perhaps. Settlements, some centuries old, had still no bigger than pinheads on the untouched expanse of their background. 
We pushed along, stopped, landed soldiers, and went on. Landed custom house clerks to levy toll in what looked like a godforsaken wilderness, with a tin shed and a flagpole lost in it. Landed more soldiers to take care of the customs house clerks, presumably. Some, I heard, got drowned in the surf. But whether they did or not, nobody seemed particularly to care. They were just flung out there, and on we went. Every day the coast looked the same, as though we had not moved. But we passed various places, trading places, with names like Grand Bassam, Little Popo, names that seemed to belong to some sordid farce acted in front of a sister back cloth. The idleness of a passenger. My isolation amongst all these men with whom I had no point of contact. The oily and languid sea. The uniform somberness of the coast seemed to keep me away from the truth of things. Within the toil of a mournful, senseless delusion. The voice of the surf heard now, and then was a positive pleasure, like the speech of a brother. It was something natural, and had its reason, that had a meaning. Now and then, a boat from the shore gave one a momentary contact with reality. It was paddled by black fellows. They could see from afar the white of their eyeballs glistening. They shouted, sang. Their bodies streamed with perspiration. They had faces like grotesque masks. These chaps, but they had bone, muscle, a wild vitality, an intense energy of movement that was as natural and true as a surf along the coast. They wanted no excuse for being there. They were a great comfort to look at. For a time, I would feel I belonged still to a world of straightforward facts, but the feeling would not last long. Something would turn up to scare it away. Once, I remember, we came upon a man of war anchored off the coast. There wasn't even a shed there, and she was shelling the bush. It appears the French had one of their wars going on thereabouts. Her ensign dropped limp like a rag. The muzzles of the long six-inch gun stuck out all over the low hull. The greasy, slimy swell swung her up lazily and let her down, swaying her thin masts. In the empty immensity of earth, sky, and water, there she was, incomprehensible, firing into a continent. Pop. There would go one of the six-inch guns. A small flame would dart and vanish. A little white smoke would disappear. A tiny projectile would give a feeble screech. And nothing happened. Nothing could happen. There was a touch of insanity in the proceeding. A sense of lugubrious drollery in the sight. But it was not dissipated by somebody on board assuring me earnestly that there was a camp of natives. He called them enemies, hidden out of sight somewhere. We gave her her letters. I heard the men in that lonely ship were dying of fever at a rate of three a day, and went on. We called at some, more places with farkishal names, where the merry dance of death and trade goes on in a still and earthy atmosphere, as of an overheated catacomb. All along the formless coast, bordered by dangerous surf, as if nature herself had tried to ward off intruders, in and out of rivers, streams of death and life, whose banks were rotting into mud, whose waters, thickened into slime, invaded the contorted mangroves, and seemed to writhe with us in the extremity of an impotent despair. Nowhere did we stop long enough to get a particularized impression, but the general sense of vague and oppressive wonder grew up upon me. It was like a wary pilgrimage amongst hints of nightmares. It was upward of thirty days before I saw the mouth of the big river. We anchored off the seat of the government, but my work would not begin till some two hundred miles further on. So, as soon as I could, I made a start for the place thirty miles higher up. I had my passage on a little sea-going steamer. Her captain was a Swede and knowing me for a seaman, invited me on the bridge. He was a young man, lean, fair and morose, with lanky hair and a shuffling gait. As we left the miserable little wharf, he tossed his head contemptuously at the shore. 
I've been living there, he asked. I said, yes. Fine lot these government chaps, are they not? He went on, speaking English with great precision and considerable bitterness. It is funny what some people do for a few francs a month. I wonder what becomes of that kind when it goes up country. I said to him, I expected to see that soon. Oh, so, he exclaimed, shuffled a thwart, keeping one eye ahead vigorously. Don't be too sure, he continued. The other day I took up a man who hanged himself on the road. He's a Swede too. Uh, hanged himself? Why in God's name? I cried. He kept on looking out watchfully. Eh, who knows? The sun, too much for him. The country, perhaps. At last we opened a reach. A rocky cliff appeared. Mounds have turned up earth by the shore. Houses on a hill. Others with iron roofs. Amongst a waste of excavations. Are hanging to the declivity. A continuous noise of the rapids above hovered over the scene of inhabited devastation. A lot of people, mostly black and naked, moved about like ants. A jetty projected into the river. A blinding sunlight drowned all this at times in a sudden recrudescence of glare. There's your company station, said the Swede, pointing to three wooden barrack-like structures on the rocky slope. I'll send your things up. Four boxes, did you say? So, farewell. I came upon a boiler, wallowing in the grass, then found a path leading up the hill. It turned aside for the boulders, and also for an undersized railway truck lying there on its back with its wheels in the air. One was off. The thing looked as dead as the carcass of some animal. I came upon more pieces of decaying machinery, a stack of rusty nails. To the left, a clump of trees made a shady spot where dark things seemed to stir feebly. I blinked. The path was steep. A horn tooted to the right, and I saw the black people run. A heavy and dull detonation shook the ground. A puff of smoke came out of the cliff, and that was all. No change appeared on the face of the rock. They're building a railway. The cliff was not in the way or anything, but this... An objectless blasting was all the work going on. A slight clinking behind me made me turn my head. Six black men advanced in a file, toiling up the path. They walked erect and slow, balancing small baskets full of earth on their heads, and the clink kept time with their footsteps. Black rags were wound round their loins, and the short ends behind waggled to and fro like tails. I could see every rib. The joint of their limbs were like knots in a rope. Each had an iron collar on his neck. They were all connected together with a chain, whose bites swung between them, rhythmically clinking. Another report from the cliff made me think suddenly of that ship of war I had seen firing into the continent. It was the same kind of ominous voice. But these men could by no stretch of the imagination be called enemies. They were called criminals. And the outraged law, like the bursting shells, had come to them, an insoluble mystery from the sea. All their meager breasts panted together, and the violently dilated nostrils quivered. The eyes stared stonily uphill. They passed me within six inches, without a glance, with that complete, death-like indifference of unhappy savages. Behind this raw matter, one of the reclaimed, the product of the two new forces at work, strolled despondently, carrying a rifle by its middle. He had a uniform jacket with one button off, and, seeing a white man on the path, hoisted his weapon to his shoulder with alacrity. This was simple prudence. White men, being so much like at a distance that he could not tell who I might be, he was speedily reassured and with a large, white, rascally grin and a glance at his charge, seemed to take me into partnership and exalted trust. After all, I also was a part of the great cause of these high and just proceedings. Instead of going up, I turned and descended to the left. My idea was to let that chain gang get out of sight before I climbed the hill. You know, I'm not particularly tender. I've had to strike and defend off. I've had to resist and to attack sometimes. 
That's only one way of resisting, without counting the exact cost, according to the demands of such sort life as I have blundered into. I've seen the devil of violence, and the devil of greed, and the devil of hot desire, but by all the stars these were strong, lusty, red-eyed devils that swayed and drove men. Men, I tell you. But, as I stood on this hillside, I foresaw that in the blinding sunshine of that land, I had become acquainted with the flabby, pretending, weak-eyed devil of rakacious, pitiless folly. How insidious he could be. Two, it was only to find out several months later and a thousand miles farther. For a moment, I stood appalled, as though by a warning. Finally, I descended the hill obliquely towards the trees I had seen. I avoided a fast, artificial hole somebody had been digging on the slope, the purpose of which I found it impossible to divine. It wasn't a quarry or sand pit, anyhow. It was just a hole. It might have been connected with the philanthropic desire of giving the criminals something to do. I don't know. Then, I nearly fell into a very narrow ravine, Almost no more than a scar in the hillside. I discovered that a lot of important drainage pipes for the settlement had been tumbled into there. There wasn't one that was not broken. It was a wanton mashup. At last, I got under the trees. My purpose was to stroll into the shade for a moment, but no sooner within than it seemed to me that I had stepped into the gloomy circle of some inferno. The rapids were near and an interrupted uniform, headlong, rushing noise filled the mournful stillness of the grove, where not a breath stirred, not a leaf moved, and a mysterious sound, as though the tearing pace of a launched earth had suddenly become audible. Black shapes crouched, lay, and sat between the trees leaning against the trunks, clinging to the earth, half coming out, half a face with a dim light, and all the attitudes of pain, abandonment, and despair. Another mine on the cliff went off, followed by a slight shudder of the soil underneath my feet. The work was going on. The work? And this was the place where some of the helpers had withdrawn to die. They were dying slowly. It was very clear. They were not enemies. They were not criminals. They were nothing earthly now. Nothing but black shadows of disease and starvation, lying confusedly in the greenish gloom. Brought from all the recesses of the coast and all the legality of time contracts, lost in the congenial surroundings, and fed on unfamiliar food, they sickened, became inefficient, and were then allowed to crawl away and rest. These moribund shapes were as free as air, nearly as thin. I began to distinguish the gleam of their eyes underneath the trees. Then, glaring down, I saw a face near my hand. The black bones reclined at full length within one shoulder against the tree, and slowly the eyelids rose and the sunken eyes looked up at me, enormous and vacant, a kind of blind, a white flicker in the depths of the orbs, which died out slowly. The man seemed young, almost a boy, but you know with him it's hard to tell. I found nothing else to do but to offer him one of my good Swede ship's biscuits I had in my pocket. The fingers closed slowly on it and held. There was no other movement and no other glance. He had tied a bit of white worsted around his neck. Why? Where did he get it? Was it a badge? An ornament? A charm? A proprietary act? Was there any idea at all connected with it? It looked startling around his black neck. A bit of white thread from beyond the seas. Near the same time... Two more bundles of acute angles sat with their legs drawn up. One, with his chin propped up on his knees, stared at nothing in an intolerable and appalling manner. His brother Phantom rested its forehead, as if overcome with great weariness, and all about others were scattered in every pose of contorted collapse, as in some kind of massacre of a pestilence. While I stood horror-struck, one of these creatures rose to his hands and knees and went on all fours towards the river to drink. He lapped out of his hand, then sat up in the sunlight, crossing his shins in front of him, and after a time let his woolly head fall on his breastbone. 
I didn't want any more loitering in the shade, and I made haste towards the station. When near the buildings, I met a white man, in such an unexpected elegance of get-up, that in the first moment I took him for a sort of vision. I saw a high-starched collar, white cuffs, a light alpaca jacket, snowy trousers, clean necktie, and varnished boots. No hat, hair parted, brushed, oiled, under a green-lined parasol held in his big white hand. He was amazing, and had a pen holder behind his ear. I shook hands with this miracle, and I learned he was the company's chief accountant, and that all the bookkeeping was done at this station. He had come out for a moment, he said, to get a breath of fresh air. The expression sounded wonderfully odd, with a suggestion of sedentary desk life. I wouldn't have mentioned the fellow to you at all. Only if it wasn't from his lips that I first heard the name of the man whom it is so indissolubly connected with the memories of that time. Moreover, I respected the fellow. Yes, I respected his collars, his vast cuffs, his brushed hair. His appearance was certainly that of a hairdresser's dummy. But in the great demoralization of the land, he kept up his appearance. That backbone. His starched collars and got-up shirt fronts were achieved his character. He had only been out nearly three years. And later, I could not help ask him how he managed to sport such linen. He had just the faintest blush, and said modestly, I had been teaching one of the native women about the station. It was difficult. She had a distaste for the work. Thus the man had verily accomplished something, and he was devoted to his books, which were in apple pie order. Everything else in the station was in a muddle. Heads, things, buildings. Strings of dusty uh, gamers with splay feet arrived and departed. A stream of manufactured goods, rubbishy cottons, beads, and brass wire set into the depths of darkness, and in return came a precious trickle of ivory. I had to wait in the station for ten days, an eternity. I lived in a hut in the yard, and to be out of the chaos, I would sometimes get into an accountant's office. It was built of horizontal planks, and so badly put together that as he bent over his high desk, he was barred from neck to heels with narrow strips of sunlight. There was no need to open the big shutter to see. It was hot there, too. Big flies buzzed fiendishly, and did not sting, but stabbed. I sat generally on the floor, in the wild, a faultless appearance, and even slightly scented, perching on a high stool, he wrote. Sometimes, he stood up for exercise, when a truckle bed with a sick man, some invalid agent from upcountry, was put in there. He exhibited a gentle annoyance. The groans of this sick person, he said, distract my attention. And without that, it is extremely difficult to guard against clerical errors in this climate. One day, he remarked, without lifting his head, in the interior you'll no doubt meet Mr. Kurtz. All my asking of Mr. Kurtz was, he said he was a first-class agent. And seeing my disappointment at this information, he added, slowly, lying down his pen, He is a very remarkable person. Further questions elicited from him that Mr. Kurtz was at present in charge of a trading post, a very important one, in the true ivory country, at uh, the very bottom of there, since as much ivory as all the others put together. He began to write again. The sick man was too ill to groan. The flies buzzed and they had a great pace. And suddenly, there was a growing murmur of voices and a great tramping of feet. The caravan had come in. A violent babble of uncouth sounds burst out on the other side of the planks. All the carriers were speaking together, and in the midst of the uproar, the lamentable voice of the chief agent was heard, giving it up, cheerfully for the twentieth time that day. He rose slowly. What a frightful row, he said. He crossed the room gently to look at the sick man, and returning, said to me, He does not hear. What? Dead? I asked. I'm startled. No, not yet, he answered, with great composure. Then alluding, with a toss of the head to the tumult in the station yard, when one has got to make correct entries, one becomes to hate those savages, hate them to death. 
He returned thoughtful for a moment. When you see Mr. Kurtz, he went on, tell him for me that everything here, he glanced at the deck, is very satisfactory. I don't like to write to him. With those messengers of yours, you never know what you might get hold of in your letter at that central station. He stared at me for a moment with his mild, bulging eyes. Oh, he'll go far, very far, he began again. He'll be a somebody in the administration before long. They above the council in Europe. You know. Mean him to be. He turned to his work. The noise outside had ceased, and presently, in going out, I stopped at the door. In the steady buzz of flies, the homeward-bound agent was lying finished and insensible. The other, bent over his books, was making correct entries of perfectly correct transactions. And fifty feet below the doorstep, I could see the still treetops of the Grove of Death. Next day, I left the station at last, with a caravan of sixty men, for a two hundred mile tramp. No use telling you much about that. Paths, paths everywhere. The stamped in network of paths spreading out over the empty land, through the long grass, through burnt grass, through thickets, down up chilly ravines, up and down stony hills ablaze with heat. And a solitude. Solitude, nobody, not a hut. The population was cleared out a long time ago. Well, if not for the mysterious uh, gamers, armed with all kinds of fearful weaponry, suddenly took to traveling on the road between Deal and Gravesend, catching the yokels right and left to carry the heavy loads for them. I fancy every farm and cottage thereabouts would get empty very soon. Over here the dwellings were gone, too. And sometimes I passed through several abandoned villages. There's something pathetically childish in the ruins of grass walls. And day after day, with a scamp and shuffle of sixty pairs of bare feet behind me, each pair under a sixty pound load camp, cook, sleep, strike camp, march, and now and then a carrier dead in harness, and rest in the long grass near the path, with an empty water gourd and his long staff lying by his side great silence around and above. Perhaps on some quiet night the tremor of far-off drums, sinking, swelling, a tremor vast and faint, a sound weird, appalling, suggestive, and wild, and perhaps with a profound meaning as the sound of bells in a Christian country. Once, a white man in an unbuttoned uniform, camping on the path of an armed escort of Lang Zamzaris, was very hospital and festive, not to say drunk, was looking after the upkeep of the road. He declared, Can't say I saw any road or any upkeep unless the body of a middle-aged uh, gamer with a bullet hole in his forehead, upon which I absolutely stumbled three miles further on, may be considered as a permanent improvement. I had a white companion, too. Not a bad chap, but rather too fleshy, and with the exasperating habit of fainting on the hot hillsides, Miles away from the least bit of shade and water, to annoying, you know, to hold your own coat like a parasol over a man's head while he's coming to. I couldn't help asking him once he meant by coming here at all. To make money, of course. What do you think? He said scornfully. Then he got fever, and had to be carried in a hammock slung under a pole. As he weighed sixteen stone, I had no end of rows with the carriers. They jibbed, ran away, sneaked off with their little loads in the night quite a mutiny. So one evening, I made a speech in English with gestures, not one of which was lost to the sixty pairs of eyes before me. And the next morning, I startled the hammock off all in front. An hour afterwards, I came upon the whole concern, wrecked in a bush. Man, hammock, crones, blankets, and horrors. The heavy pole had skinned his poor nose. He was very anxious for me to kill somebody but there wasn't a shadow of a carrier near. I remembered the old doctor. It'd be interesting for science to watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot. I felt I was becoming scientifically... interesting. However, all that is to no purpose. On the fifteenth day, I came inside of the big river again and hobbled into the central station. It was on a backwater surrounded by scrub and forest, with a pretty border of smelly mud on one side, and on the three others enclosed by a crazy fence of rushes. 
A neglected gap was all the gate it had, and the first glance at the place was enough to let you see the flabby devil was running that show. White men with long staves in their hands appeared languidly from amongst the buildings, strolling up to take a look at me, and then retired out of sight somewhere. One of them, a stout, excitable chap with black mustache, informed me with great volubility and many digressions as soon as I told him who I was, that my steamer was at the bottom of the river. I was thunderstruck. But what? How? It, why? Oh, it was all right. The manager himself was there. All quite correct. Everybody had behaved splendidly. Splendidly. You must, he said in agitation. Go and see the general manager himself. At once. He's waiting. All right, guys, and that's where I'm going to pause for tonight. I'm so tired. This took this part took me so long to do because I screwed it up every three seconds. Um, again, I'll continue with my uh, report from last time. This is a this is a dandy little book so far. It's not too bad. I, can, I don't I don't want to. I'm not going to say the gamer word, so that gets a hot skip from me. Keep pulling out these really. Uh, uh, how'd you say it? Aggressive books on accident. Oops. Sorry, guys. Oops. Didn't mean to. I swear I picked one. This is the this is the book that everyone talks about. It's a, it's a cultural touchstone. Okay, they talk about it. I don't know. I, I, I said I didn't read the freaking cliff notes on this beforehand. All right. Anyways, um, sleepless tales as always. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, favorite, like, and in the comments you subscribe. Um, Leave a comment if you have anything you want to have read for you. Otherwise, you have a great night. Don't forget I love you. Um, don't forget, word of the day, week maybe, month, if you will, is scrimps. <laughs>